Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. My name is Zane Hamilton. I'm the Vice President of Sales Engineering here at CIQ. For those of you who are unfamiliar with CIQ, we're a company focused on powering the next generation of software infrastructure, leveraging the capabilities of cloud, hyperscale, and HPC. From research to the enterprise, our customers rely on us for the ultimate Rocky Linux, Werewolf, and Aptainer support escalation. We provide deep development capabilities and solutions, all delivered in the collaborative spirit of open source. Today's webinar, we're gonna be talking about electronic design automation, a topic that I know very little about. So let's bring on the panel. Very nice. Welcome everyone. So I'm gonna go around and do introductions here. I'm gonna start at the top with Brock. Uh, I'm Brock Taylor, Vice President of High Performance Computing and Strategic Partners. And uh, I did spend a few years at both Intel and AMD and will be very dangerous on the subject today of, of EDA as uh, while I lived on the software side, I do have some exposure enough to probably get a few points wrong. Uh, but hopefully uh, the, the purists out there and the silicon designers will forgive me. Dave Godlove. As you take a drink, perfect timing. <laughs> Look at that. Great timing, Zane. Hi, I'm Dave Godlove. Um, yeah, so I used to be a, uh, so I also um, don't know a whole lot about EDA. Um, I used to be a neuroscientist uh, at the NIH. Um, it was there that I became interested in high performance computing and I became a staff scientist working at BioWolf, which is the intramural uh, resource at at the NIH uh, for high performance computing. Uh, it was also it was there at BioWolf that I, you know, first came into contact with Greg and started talking to him about uh, singularity, what ultimately became Aptainer. And I've been in that community for some time now. And I understand that um, uh, containerization is used extensively in the EDA process these days. So I guess that's about, you know, maybe I can comment a little bit on that side of things. But we'll see. Great. Thank you, Dave. Welcome. Hello, uh, yes, I'm Dave D'Onofrio. I'm the Chief Harbor Architect for Tactical Computing Labs. Uh, I'm a, also a former Intel inpatient. Um, I also, <laughs> more recently, I spent about a decade at Berkeley National Labs running their mm -hmm. uh, computer architecture team and doing some fun HPC stuff there. I had a brief stint at Apple that we don't need to discuss, uh, but I've been at uh, TCL now for since 2019, and we're building a whole bunch of cool um, RISC-V-based stuff for everything from embedded all the way up to the biggest HPC. Very cool, thank you, Dave. Krishna, welcome back. Sure, glad to be here. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Krishna Krishna Muriki. Uh, right now, I am with the KLA Corporation. Um, I am working as a system design engineer, HPC architect here at the KLA Corporation. Before here, I was at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, had a lot of overlap with uh, Greg and David, too. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I was uh, part of the team running the research infrastructure over there at the lab. EDA, um, yeah, haven't worked in the EDA field directly, uh, but in the youth, uh, user support role, we supported EDA applications on the research clusters at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And the role here at KLA Corporation we are not directly in EDA. We make uh, wafer inspection devices here at KLA. Uh, the wafers that are fabricated in the fabs in Taiwan, uh, once they are made, they come uh, come out of the fab and they need to go through uh, real. We need to inspect if it is according to the design or not. It's a, it's like a powerful microscope that we build. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, camera gadgetry which I do not understand. And the data gets fed into a Linux cluster. Yeah, that's where we, I, I'm sure all of us <laughs> understand and speak. Uh, so yeah, I'm in the team. I'm in the team which builds the subsystem, the Linux cluster subsystem, uh, part of that big vapor inspection tool that the KLA builds. Uh, does is that EDA? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it overlaps a little bit with EDA. Uh, but we do, yeah, ANS, uh, to me, when we talk about EDA, things like ANSYS, the console, those are the things that come into my mind. Uh, we use those tools a little bit here at Kayla Corporation. A lot of research scientists at Berkeley Lab used them, and we supported you know, those application stack on the research clusters. Uh, 
um, yeah, that's it. Would be a fun discussion. Glad to be here. Great, thank you, Krishna. Greg, welcome back. Hi. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, my background with EDA is, uh, like many things, mostly on the infrastructure side. Um, there are many EDA facilities and clusters that are running things, obviously Rocky Linux, uh, CentOS over the years, but also Werewolf. And we've gotten a lot of reports now, or many reports of a lot of desire to properly containerize a lot of the EDA applications coming from the industry. So that's been kind of my side of the experience on it is basically working to help with the application side. But um, yeah, great discussion. The EDA is a very interesting space within computing. So I'm looking forward to kind of jumping into it and um, seeing what everybody has to offer. So thank you. Absolutely, Glenn. Hi, Glenn Otero, uh, VP of Scientific Computing, Genomics, AI, and Machine Learning at CIQ. And uh, I know just enough about EDA to be dangerous. Um, I know it's really expensive applications. <laughs> and and uh, when they start when they start their spins, they uh, they are running full bore on their on their on their processors, just squeezing every bit of performance out of it because the licenses are so expensive. Um, so I'm interested to, to hear more on what the other experts on EDA here <laughs> know. It's interesting. Thank you. So I think first off, Brock, I'm going to ask you, can you define EDA for us? Well, I mean, what is electronic design automation? It's kind of a generic term. And whenever I started looking at no, it, it is so No, broad, I cannot. So okay. <laughs> no, it, it's, um, it's actually a great question. And I, there's, there's a couple different answers, um, but the Hyperion Group, for instance, in their taxonomy, I think they have a broader definition of EDA um, that that somewhat expands infrastructure. But I think in this context, we're literally talking about the pipeline of applications that go into uh, silicon design, right? And that's that's the predominant area. And uh, uh, Krishna, I think you were, you're talking about some of the major players. Um, you know, these are giant corporations, Cadence, Synopsys, uh, you know, Mentor Graphics uh, have built massive businesses because uh, chips today are extremely complex systems. And uh, I did part of my time at Intel was as a, a power on BIOS engineer. Uh, so you're talking about after years of design and simulation work, the physical processor actually showing up in a lab and for the first time you're trying to turn it on right and this is this is a monumental effort for company like, like intel and amd and and literally it is a years long process um, you know the window what you're getting into closes well before that product is ever actually manufactured for the very first time and there's so many different things that can go wrong and so many different things you have to consider uh, going into it. So, you know, coming back to the question, defining EDA is, is really going through all the different simulation steps that you have to go through over and over again to produce that piece of silicon that, especially if it's an SOC system on chip that has lots of individual pieces that are all coming together, everything's got to be simulated. And it's not just testing out logic and making sure that with this, you know, the clock speeds of the processors that your, your gates are all going to flip fast enough that you don't get feedback loops that send you into, you know, the ether, but also now as important, the, the thermals, the, the power consumption, how that reacts and how chips change under the different workloads, the different stresses and, and what running hot means to the processor versus running cold. Um, so, you, you know, I look at EDA classically as it's, it's mainly the tooling and the process of building that silicon and uh, the applications that are there. Um, and I will add one thing kind of to this discussion, uh, and, and David, you, you might uh, respond to this as well. Um, it's hard to get the people who design the chips to be able to come into a forum like this and talk about it because 
in this case, when I say it's a dark art, it's actually a secret art, you know, and, and companies like Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, the major silicon manufacturers. I mean, this is their core bread and butter IP. So they're very guarded about how they can talk about it. And you want to talk about your innovation. So uh, it, it's one of those elements. It's, it's funny because EDA is kind of high performance computing for high performance computing, meaning you're actually using the products themselves to design the replacement products and you know what the silicon is going to do so long-winded answer to what is eda um oh that's perfect thank that's you brock good. and david i know you have something to say Kirsten, i do too but uh fernando you just joined if you want to introduce yourself that would be oh, great yeah. Sorry, I was trying to find the mute button in this. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Fernanda Forder. I've been in HPC for a while. Um, if you don't know me, I used to work at Oak Ridge National Lab, which is how I kind of um, got to know a lot of folks here. Um, I used to do training. I was training lead there. And at the time when we were all transitioning from CPUs to GPUs, and that's how I ended up meeting lots of folks in HPC. Now I'm at a startup called Voltron Data. And I can't talk too much about what we're doing here at the startup, <laughs> uh, but I can talk about the open source side of things. Um, my role right now is uh, director of developer relations, and we're helping support ecosystems that are going to help um, with our product eventually. Um, and that includes the Apache Arrow ecosystem, which is um, data transfer and um, um, also other ones that have to do with like connectivity of data, um, data manipulation, ETL, ML preparation, et cetera. Great, thank you. All right, back to you, David. I know you wanted to add to the what is EDA. Oh, sure. Uh, well, first I wanted to give a, uh, I would give a quick shout out to the pre-silicon validation folks who are using those EDA tools at Intel. Uh, for years, one of my main dev systems was a A-step prototype CPU that I pulled out of some driver waterfall cube. Uh, <laughs> and I was always very impressed that like, you know, an A-step, A-step silicon works, boots, as Windows Server 2000, I think that's right. Some very ancient thing, but that's really, um, I think yeah, the the culmination of a ton of work and being on the Power On BIOS group, I <laughs> I know I have a sense of what you went through. Um, but yeah, I think the the EDA, you know, the EDA for HPC, yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's classically been you know very compute time intensive. Um, you know, these algorithms, um, I'm sure everyone here knows are, you know, NP complete or NP hard, uh, optimizing them is really difficult. So it's a lot of heuristics. Um, and I think there's a few interesting things happening. There's obviously the AI machine learning that, you know, heuristics AI could kind of be a nice match. Um, and then there's also the, the growing open source EDA flow with open lane and open road, um, uh, where maybe that veil of secrecy you mentioned, Brock, could start to get peeled back. Um, and those tools are still, of course, in their infancy, um, but they work. You know, people are building real chips with those, uh, and perhaps that's a, a place that, you know, some interesting algorithmic optimization could happen. So. It's very interesting. Thanks, Dave. Krishna. In terms of uh, the relevance, the importance of this EDA team, EDA tools, uh, one other data point that I would add. Uh, which I got familiar with recently is these the chips these days are not two dimensional anymore. Uh, <laughs> they are building in three dimensions. You can think of the transistors and the layouts on the chips are like this commercial office space buildings where you have it's like a skyscraper of transistors on the chip and it's not two dimensional. So designing those kind of chips, uh, visualizing and making sure we're meeting the timing deadlines, <laughs> it's a magnitude complex. Uh, and these EDA tools play a real critical role uh, it is before the tape out process. And it's very important these days as the complexity of the chip is increasing. And they are trying to pack more and more transistors with the most slot. The, the transformation that the most lie is taking where you can't just uh, increase the frequency, but you can just pack in more and more transistors. So the importance and relevance of these EDA tools uh, is increasing. 
for sure. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that, Christian, and kind of back to Brock's point. So when I was researching this last night and looking around, there was someone that gave an analogy of chip design being like building a 787 Dreamliner. They had six years to design and test. They build the airplane. They can physically touch pieces of it. They can go break wings, do all that stuff. Whenever you're going through this process and actually building the silicone, you have to have the equivalent of a 787 come off the line and the first flight it takes is having passengers. And yeah. you have to do it in 12 months and you have to do it again every 12 months after. So yep. <laughs> it was mind blowing to me to think that you're getting that complex in design and you have to do it that fast. So that was very eye opening when I started looking through this. I think we've touched on where is it used, but uh, Kirsten, you kind of touched on one thing that kept coming up and it was Moore's law and, and that how that line started off very flat from the 2000s and then it, it finally started going almost straight up. So where are we today? Um, I don't know. No, the numbers. Uh, Brock, maybe you know how many transistors we're packing these days. <laughs> well, I, I, I was actually, uh, I, I had to catch myself because I, I was like thinking, how many are on there? You know, is it billions? Is it tens of billions? And then it's, well, there's transistors, there's gates, uh, you know, so I, I actually Googled that question uh, earlier in the week and you get all kinds of answers, but it, it really comes into, it used to be, you know, Moore's law was as much about uh, increasing speed as well as, as the silicon. And now, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely shifted to more, call it width of computing and more, you know, it went from single core that ran infinitely fast to tons of cores that are all running reasonably fast. And what you're seeing, I think, is a lot of combinations that are coming down the pipeline. So uh, I'm going to be a little careful because um, it's a little difficult having worked in both Intel and AMD. You know what what I can say, what I can't say uh, in any given time. You know, kind of from end of your your point earlier, it's like you, you, there's a line you can say, and there's some things you have to hold back, and sometimes it's it's hard to hold back. Um, but I, I know AMD, for instance, has announced, uh, you know, they've they've got some ideas of now adding, you know, on an SOC, you've got specialized chiplets, not just CPU chiplets or GPU chiplets, but combinations that are coming in. And, uh, you know, I, I got to think that just elevates the validation nightmare to a, another level, right? You know, and it's, it's a massive amount of stress for these people. I, you know, even on the validation side, um, yeah, we were making software for something that didn't exist, but you have a basis. Uh, but the pressure on the people actually doing that that design and doing the pre-silicon validation before it's ever manufactured, if you get it wrong, everybody knows about it. Everybody in the company knows you got it wrong. If you get it right, no better, nobody ever really hears about it. <laughs> so it, it's it's very tough. Um, I cheated. I, I went and looked at Google. 290 million transistors um, using Intel 65 nanometer process. Yep. 65 nanometer really process. <laughs> really old, I think, right? <laughs> These days, we are at a single digit nanometer. Uh, 14 nanometer is the latest. The latest chip that yeah, 65 was like 14 years ago, 15 years yeah. ago. Oh, yeah, it should be. I think <laughs> Transistors, per, yeah, transistors, yeah, uh, transistors per wafer, I think, yeah, I said I don't remember, but as I think for more, I did hear within KLA that the transistors per wafer that we are having to measure these days is in trillions per wafer, not per chip, but wafer, wafer has yeah. a lot of in it, is in trillions, not in millions anymore. It's in trillions, the number of transistors that we are measuring. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's it's huge. You know that uh, that's a part of, of the EDA process. I I don't know how much is simulation, but but yield on the actual wafers is is a massive element that silicon manufacturers and foundries face. And I got to think uh, again. I I don't actually know that part very well at all. But I got to think that's a, a at least a good stage of the pipeline is. When you get the designs, what's the projected yield, right? And I don't know how much simulation is there, 
Um, but again, it's a pipeline. It, it is a, a whole bunch of applications that go into designing silicon. It's not just one application. Um, and that presents a, a lot of complexities to what do you what do you run that on, right? There are different applications. And just like the broad HPC space, applications have different needs and, and can be optimized for different parts of an architecture or different systems. When you've got 10 different applications, the chances you have a system that's optimized for all 10 is pretty small. And so, you know, you're looking at decisions that, that companies have to make. Do you optimize for the RTL verification or validation? Do you optimize for a different part of the pipeline? Um, and again, it's, do you, are you running this in house? Um, if you're running it in your own data center, uh, how much of a resource do you have to commit to this? Uh, and, and I definitely cannot comment on how much of a resource Intel or AMD provide on that, but I can tell you that uh, at least 15 years ago or so, that was the, the primary elements that were run inside of their own data centers. And these are literally fortresses to build to keep people out because, again, it's their core IP, right? It is what they built the company on. And they're very protective of that. Uh, so cloud is a really, I would say, sensitive topic that comes into silicon uh, because of the security and, uh, you know, cloud provides a great advantage to silicon design because you can expand based on what you're willing to pay for, how much you need in a given time frame, but you're putting your IP in a public cloud or, or somewhere. And people get really nervous about that, even though they are very secure environments. It's just, it's not their building, right? They don't control the security. So there's a human nature to that. And I have several other questions, but I know, Fernando, you had something you wanted to add about the chiplets and design. So I have thoughts. I have thoughts Absolutely. about the future of chip design. <laughs> I am terrified of chiplets. Absolutely <laughs> terrified. Anybody that has ever tried to do heterogeneous computing and development for heterogeneous computing knows how hard it is. And so much of this is going to be dependent on how it's implemented by the, the, by the, the, the chip manufacturer, the chip company, right? So I've yeah. worked with you now. Um, NVIDIA and this other startup called Next Silicon. And, you know, so much of that's going to go into runtime. So much of that is going to go into like actual system runtime. And you're not going to have a lot of control where it lands, right? Like you might have some control, but I don't think in the future, if you start adding these little tiny pieces, like you have, you know, L1 caches and L2 caches, at some point you're not going to have control of where it lands. It's going to decide for you. And then you're playing this game of trying to like trigger this runtime to put it in the right place, right? Or maybe maybe there will be a programming API or something like that. Or you can say, okay, now force this to go here and not there. But I think chiplets are, so chip design in, in general, let's take a step back on chip design. There's so many moving parts. I was floored once I got a view into it because you come from the software world, you're up here. You have the emulator, you have the actual FPGA, you know, simulator, you have the actual um, person that's doing the little design with the little clicky clicky, like, and it's an entire file and it's huge. Somewhere along the way, these scenes kind of get out of sync. You have to make sure that you simulate and your emulator is in sync with the person that's actually doing the chip design. And it's some, somewhere along the way and, and places and stories that I've heard is that somebody forgets to like reconnect something like a <laughs> and your entire bat and you're like six months out eight months out with this order and your entire batch is like garbage now because somebody forgot to reconnect it or fix something because they added a feature last minute and now you don't have that circuit and now you have to build software on top of it to circumvent what happened <laughs> that's terrible. It's insane that we even get anything that works and so now when i think of that process just for a regular old like mono type chip whatever we're going to call it right Imagine that with chiplets on the same, on the same packet, like insane. You, you summed it up better than anybody I've ever seen in a tweet you did about a month ago on this subject. I wish I remember exactly what you said, but it was, it, you, you had it right there. It's just like, 
you thought it was hard today. Wait, wait for this. What's coming? And it, it is, it is. It's a, it's amazing that these things actually work. And I'm convinced nobody, no one person actually knows how it all goes together, except maybe for Glenn. He knows, he knows all. So, so this adds. This kind of brings up my next two questions, and I'll go a little bit in a, in a weird order. But when I was looking at this, and Carissa, you mentioned this earlier, talking about a fab, and I saw that it. In 2020, it cost about $10 billion to build a fab. That's what it cost. There were only three companies that were really doing it at the time. And of that $10 billion, they depreciated $100 every minute. So to make them viable, you had to get $500 in revenue every minute, which just made it a very odd business model. But that entire supply chain that fed that was built around that model. So all the parts were the same, no matter what vendor you were going to. So it was a very controlled and very small industry. But being that expensive, kind of to Fernanda's point, what is making it more expensive? The more complicated we get, we're only going to drive costs up, I'm assuming. But there are a lot of factors in what makes it expensive. So it's not just the fab itself. There's the design, the people, the software. What are all of those things that we're going to have to change or make more complicated? How is that going to drive that cost up? So Mikio Kraku was in the, I don't know if you asked somebody else to answer. Did you ask somebody? No, else? go for it. Absolutely. Yeah, so in, Mikio yeah. Kraku was at um, SC17, I think it was. And he said, in the future, chip chip design will be the easy part. Like everybody will have their own chip. And I think he was right about that. I'm not, he's, you know, he's sort of a futurist. He's out there. He's got awesome hair, but I'm not into that <laughs> part of Mikio. But, but I think he was absolutely right about that. I think the design itself, Anybody can just basically play with some circuits and design something today. In fact, that's probably more accessible and easier because a lot of what you get for the design software is you already get the package. You know what's coming from that specific fab and you know what things you can put in there. Like, no, we can only do this and this is the size and this and stuff. So you sort of have already that, that framework. It's, and it's, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but it's definitely much easier today to create lots of variations on these things. It's the latter part. It's trying to create some innovation on top of it, number one. Number two is trying to push the envelope and say, pushing the fab to create something that's lower powered, right? The requirements for power today still remain pretty high, or in other words, or at least we want them to be low, but like the push for low power is pretty high. And then what I think makes it the whole thing super expensive is just the fab process itself. That is very like, as a material scientist is super expensive, right? Everything about that process is super expensive. And just the materials themselves, super expensive. The liquid, the chemistry, super expensive, right? I don't think we can cheapen that in any way. The design, I think we can, but that latter part, I'm not sure that we can make it any better. But the more complicated you make it ship, you're not gonna be able to necessarily speed up that process. I mean, right. facilities built, it is what it is until it's depreciated right. and goes away and you build a new one. But I was also reading that those are cleaner than a hospital operating room, which I'm not saying that those are the cleanest places on earth, but that's pretty fascinating that they have to be kept that clean, that they're recirculating the air in the entire facility every I think it's six seconds. So very fascinating to me. I was kind of kept going down the rabbit hole. No, it, it, it's again, it's, it's, it's kind of a part of the full process, but um, there are many chemical engineers and biomedical engineers that are in huge demand uh, you know, especially Ohio right now where, you know, the new fabs are, are going into construction, but the air quality is a constant monitor job. They're constantly looking at that because any impurities can, can sap the, the profitability of a fab. And as well, you're talking about product lines that have to be running for years, right? You know, so it, as they're selling these, these, products into industry, industries have to rely that they're going to be able to get replacement parts for years. So, you know, uh, again, Greg brought up 65 nanometer. I'm, I'm fairly certain there's still 65 nanometer products being produced because there are consumers of them, but you've got to have all these different places. That's why you have to have multiple fabs and you're constantly building the next fab for what's coming out in three years, because it's got to have a different process, right? And it's again, but I think the software side of it is is as scary as what's 
what's going on in the hardware because more and more you're just not necessarily going to know every in and out of thing and you may you know what i think developers if they're not losing sleep over it they will be it's there's going to be 80 different architectures to choose from and support because it is becoming easier for more people to produce specialized silicon not not huge cpus but a small chiplet or something that connects to cpu that targets one kernel in in a graph processing or an accelerator for one type of algorithm and so developers are always having to learn you know how do i handle all this stuff and inevitably you're going to be relying on a library that does some magic you know and it's the it's literally write some code yada 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 get the answer right you know and in between what what's going on it's i'm glad i'm not developing <laughs> I <can say. laughs> Glenn, i think you had something you wanted to add to what fernando was saying uh yeah for, uh I just want to point out that Brock just yada 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 over the algorithm, and uh, <laughs> and the name the new name for my mouse is a little clickety click. Thanks, Fernando. Mm -hmm. um, so I serendipitously learned today as I uh, this morning I was talking to a uh, silicon vendor that I'll remain anonymous. Uh, it, it's kind of crossed my path. So uh, OpenEye Software, um, which is a Traditionally, a software company creates software for designing molecules and molecule design uh, that is um, used by all, if not almost all, if not all, like pharma companies to help them design drugs. This company was purchased by Cadence uh, not long ago. And the reasoning is they're going to use open eyes, molecular design software this, so they can actually now start targeting, designing, you know, chips at the molecular level. Uh, and they also want to pair it with their finite element analysis and some solvers that Cadence already has to kind of increase, in, you know, continue to improve the process. So, you know, the, the pressure for like to Fernanda's point about trying to innovate, uh, trying to make it more cost efficient and things like that. Uh, as you get into more and more complicated designs is, you know, now they're pulling in, you know, drug design, or I should say mo molecule design software. So um, it's, it's, that's, that, that's all I got for EDA. That's my, everything I knew about EDA was right there. <laughs> we the, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So I want to uh, emphasize Zane, Zane, what you said a few minutes back, that this whole, industry is still niche, not a lot of players. I mean, uh, how many fabs are there? TSMC, Samsung, Intel, Micron, um, big players. Uh, I know a lot of small players are coming up in China these days, but it's so niche and it is so critical for this very limited number of fabs that exist in the world to keep producing the rate at which they are producing the chips. I mean, we need chips for each and everything these days, right? I mean, number of chips that goes into an automobile. You know, the whole car industry got impacted, automobile industry got impacted because of the supply chain issues at the fabs. It's This is becoming so critical, and that's the reason why the Chips Act has, uh, how this government has realized how this industry has become so niche and uh, located in some areas in the world only, and if those areas are politically sensitive, then the whole the world economy can be get impacted. That's the reason why the chips act came in. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to stress was the fact that any impact to the production lines for short periods of time, either because of this. As Fernanda said, maybe some design engineer forgot to connect two different things. <laughs> to, to think, uh, it, the impact of the production line is thousands and millions of dollars. If, 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 if one line at a fab goes offline for one hour, I think I heard something like 350k a house in Midwest. That's the cost that they lose, that the fab loses in one of the pipelines. It goes offline for one hour. They have a lot of pipelines, and if the whole fab is out, then yeah, 
will easily go into millions and of loss, of productivity loss. Um, so it, 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 it's becoming very critical. And all the ecosystem, the EDA tools, the inspection devices like the product that KLA manufacturers are all very critical. And they do, this is the reason why the cost is so high. Uh, because the very niche players, very few players, and the productivity of those players is so important. Uh, and any tools that get into that pipeline is really expensive <laughs> because of that. Uh, for that uh, it gives the picture of yeah. absolutely and i feel like i saw somewhere that a fab like an average fab can spit out fifty thousand wafers a day is kind of the average run rate for what they're doing which is it's astonishing to me david i think you had something you wanted to add oh yeah so i wanted to kind of chase the cost thread a bit um so it, was, you know, it seems like there's a couple of ways that moore's law could go right there's the increasing complexity and density of chips um but as that, as you know, as we're getting to molecular scale and other maybe maybe acts of desperation, depending on how you look at it, you know, there's another curve that we can latch onto, which is the cost curve, right? Can we make um, existing chips that are quite powerful? I mean, a, a 16, you know, seven nanometer process, you can do amazing things. We look at the technology we have today, um, and as you know, will the cost of that become less? Uh, we sort of see that in the EDA tools. If I, uh, I don't, would that come as a surprise to anyone if you go to Synopsis or Cadence and say, I want your latest tech from five years ago, it costs a lot less than the latest tech for today, right? I think that's a, I think I can say that without anyone <laughs> yelling at me too much. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, is it possible that maybe this, this cost curve will be the next big revolution? Um, and maybe that could, you know, combine with, we're seeing trends in a lot of specialized devices, the route uh, computing, heterogeneous computing, you certainly mentioned. Um, could these things kind of start to come together to, you know, create a new revolution in in, uh, in computing? Thank you, David. That brings up another interesting point that I kind of want to ask. When you start looking at things that exist today, how can we optimize or make them better? So that really brings to my mind: How does HPC actually play in EDA? I think we kind of touched on it, but what does that look like? Well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start because uh, there's a great example that, uh, again, leads to that phrase HPC for HPC, and that's uh, AMD's Milan X product. So Krishna talked about 3D die stacking. Uh, AMD's first introduction was Milan X about, uh, I guess we're close to a year and a half ago, about a year and a half ago that it, it launched. And this is... They took the standard Milan or Epic 7003 series processor and they took the on each chiplet the L3 cache and stacked three of them on top of each other. Right. And so they they literally created that processor. And one of the primary targets of Milan X was EDA. Right. So you've got you've got a high-end server built to run very specifically high performance computing workloads in a few areas, um, targeting an industry to build silicon. And I think, uh, you know, Mark Papermaster at AMD just did a, the keynote of DAC back in July. Um, prior to that, leading up to the Milan X launch, uh, I think AMD went to hot chips and they talked about the design process. And the fact is, you know, they were very open about they are fellow travelers in EDA uh, using EDA to produce chips for people to do EDA. So it's a it's a really interesting story to talk about. And with the die stacking, you know, part of this was really modeling the thermals as you're putting the chips under workload and how you keep that chip cool. Um, and, you know, and then it it does come into how do you make that cost productive because cache, uh, high bandwidth memory, it's all you know, varying labels, layers of complexity and cost. The bigger those cash, the, the much more expensive. It's not even a linear cost. It, it goes up very steep. So um, high performance computing, again, it's, it's the various phases of the EDA pipeline are themselves computational, computationally intensive workloads. Um, 
I believe RTL, uh, the the run level uh, or the the logic validation is a big chunk of that. Um, and the Milan X product from AMD showed a, a massive jump. It was like a 66 to 70 percent performance improvement. So you're talking about either much shorter time to run the same amount of simulation or a whole lot more in the same given time, right? And either one of those scenarios can be very beneficial, but it's part of the pipeline. And so different phases saw different benefits out of the silicon. And so it's, you know, it's, you have to understand a whole lot and that just gets right into what is HPC. It's a massive amount of all these complex pieces, hardware and software going together. It's understanding how the workloads need to land on the right uh, solution that's best for it. And it's also, you know, people developing the applications, having to handle all these different nuanced architectures, right? And so it's, it's, a, it's an ecosystem problem that requires an ecosystem of partners. It's not a one, one stop shop can give you everything. Um, but I think, you know, a combination of cloud, the combination of the big players, um, you know, lots of people are, are able to design pieces of silicon. And as, you know, Fernandez tweet points out, it, it's going to be massive layers of complexity for developers. But at some point, you're going to see these things come together and magic will happen and it's, it's going to work. So. Thank you, Bob. Krishna. Yeah, um, it's, it's very clear, obvious, the, the computational complexity is there and the HPC is needed. I wanted to extend that one more level and say EDA field is not only attracted to HPC, but they're also heavily attracted to using containers. Um, singularity was a big hit in this uh, field. Primary reason what I observed this industry, uh, fabs, EDA tools, EDA tool manufacturers, being so critical, they're not, I, I feel that they're not very agile. They do not uh, uh, adopt the latest and greatest ways of building the software, uh, building infrastructure. Um, uh, when I had to support, install these applications like Comsol, ANSYS, Mendel Graphic Tools on a a modern Linux cluster which is running Red Hat or CentOS, it was a nightmare. It was not easy. <laughs> so I don't know who builds software in 32 bits still. They still use a lot of libraries which are 32 bits, statically compiled. I, there is no source code available. I just have to get the binaries and make the binaries running on a 64 bit environment. Uh, well, it's not easy. If I go to the system administrator and I'll ask him to install this package, it gives me the 32 bit libraries. He will look me up and down and he'll say, Get out of here. So, the, the way this build, this software is built, is it's still, it can use a lot of improvements. And I'm sure the, the priorities of them is at a different place where they need to ship out these products quickly. Uh, to meet the next uh, in, uh, innovation that's happening in the chip industry, right? So maybe their priorities are different. So that brings challenges for a common <laughs> people like us who are trying to support these applications. That uh, containers came in as a savior of there, right? I mean, if I need to make my own container with my own OS with all the packages that I need for this particular EDA tool, it's easy for me to do that, uh, do that, and take it onto a shared HPC cluster where the admin won't let me even touch uh, the pristine base OS. I can bring my own OS with all the packages that I want and freedom, flexibility, uh, and getting things done. Yeah, that's, that, that attracted this EDA user community to containers uh, real early on when Singularity came out. Um, I, I wanted to express that point, yeah. Uh, total adoption of HPC is obvious and it's the reason why containers also was heavily adopted by the EU. Absolutely, Greg. So th this, this discussion has been enlightening to me. Um, 
I've, again, I've kind of worked with EDA tangentially as I've helped on the infrastructure side. And I've heard things said like, you know, EDA is one of the few areas inside of computing in which you typically and commonly spend more on software than you do on hardware. As a matter of fact, I think it's about the number that I got was about 5x the amount on software. So there's a, there's a huge amount of um, legacy that's built into, I think, some of this. And that legacy is, is, is required to some extent um, because things work. Nobody wants to change it. And this is such a high risk market in terms of the amount of capital going in and out of it. You, you don't want to risk change. You don't want to risk um, you know, doing something that may, may break this, right? It's more important to make sure you have something that works. To Christian's point about containers, yeah, I've, I've you know, in, in conversations that I've had with people that are doing EDA work, um, there's been a high interest in wanting containers. And I can tell you 100%, most of the consumers and providers uh, ha have reached out to the vendors of EDA software asking for containers. Um, some of the reasoning that I've heard back usually has to do with things like, um, you know, they, they, again, the vendor also doesn't want to change or they're more concerned about um, it's circumventing licensing somehow. Uh, and, and we have to properly do license management and whatnot and kind of uh, facilitate that through the container, uh, make sure that they feel comfortable with that, but also, to Chris's point, the amount that this would help everything, if if all of these applications were containerized and they can provide a base, basically a standard, right? This is the container that's going to work for this. This is the container that's going to work for this. And then you can do so much with it, whether you're using Singularity, Apptainer, whether you're using a Kubernetes environment, whether, I mean, whatever you're using, right? Um, you now have a platform that you can kind of take these applications and go and easily create building blocks that you can go and further extend. So um, I think the EDA market is a really interesting one within the within computing. And, and again, I appreciate the discussion because I learned a lot about why is it that way? Things I didn't realize. So thank you. So Greg, kind of your point on that, I guess if you look at Licensing is always going to be an issue when you talk about software. It's always a difficult solution to solve. But if we start looking at a, a better way of licensing software or paying for it, that I feel like that's something that people haven't done a lot of. It's typically been in that legacy model of I have X number of things. So I think there's an opportunity there to maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Especially as we start thinking more about cloud native computing environments. Um, you know, a, a, a more traditional high performance computing system of, you know, static, static clusters, static nodes and whatnot, you can kind of manage licenses through that. Like we know how to do that. You mm -hmm. don't really know how to do that in a cloud native way, especially a federated cloud native way. So that's, that's going to need some, um, some research development and then some, um, well, some legacy <laughs> to basically give people confidence in terms of how it works, how it operates. Uh, so it'll just take time. Sure. I believe we have some questions from the audience. Uh, so Art asked, would like to know more about compliance issues around IP issues in terms of public cloud adoption with large designers like Samsung and TSMC. Maybe that's too tangential or too big to address. Anybody who wants to take it. So I'm not sure about compliance uh, in terms of like um, like aerospace or automotive have to face, but I think um, you know in general I think there's there's an element of of confidence you know in what you're running in the cloud versus what's known to run on on premise is the same. And I think that does relate back to what Greg and Christian were talking about in containers. And you know, I kind of think of that hypothetical where uh, a silicon issue is found during validation and the fab line goes down or is halted. And that's, you know, throw a number on it and we're probably too small, but you know, think uh, millions a day that that you're losing when that fab is down and then you've got to turn around and find a fix and you have to validate that fix so again if you're on premise you've got fixed resources this is a great place where 
hey, we need to do the same amount of validation, but we have days to do it in, not weeks. So turning around, going to cloud where you can scale out uh, it, it much higher dimensions, but you also don't want to lose any time on spinning up the environment. So having something containerized that goes place to place, I think that fits well with what I would call compliance for the contraction with, with the actual de designers. Um, I'm not sure if there's compliance issues around the IP in most cases, unless you're getting to that, that silicon that's mission critical, like uh, you know, something that's, that's uh, life or death. Uh, and that's really, you know, that's definitely outside of my, my purview. Fernanda, I think you had something you wanted to add. Yeah, I interpreted that question as having something to do with export control and some of the IP that's generated mm -hmm. in the US. Um, we've seen in the news how much we're trying to control that kind of technology, making it to China or to other, you know, tier four or tier three class light um, nations that the, the US considers um, hostile nations. So if these folks are coming from Taiwan and, you know, they're, they're a global company, right? how do you keep that IP here? Where is it being generated? And those questions are much muddier today. Um, I think ultimately the government will just kind of have to be happy with the um, lack of export of the actual technology itself. Uh, but I think it's going to be impossible for us to keep out of the hands of players like China um, to get, because China is a big country. They have this, you know, they have raw materials, they have the source, they have the smarts, they have, an extremely large pool of very smart people that can recreate all of this. So it's going to be nearly impossible. If anything, it's probably going to accelerate their, their um, excellence and, and their uh, ability to create their own chips. And we've seen that already. That's great. Thank you, friend. At least in the case of fabs, I noticed um, they, are re they are really tightly controlled. Um, as a hardware vendor, I noticed that any drive that goes in will never come, come out. They have their own the way of destroying it. And uh, um, so as a hardware vendor, if we have to rebuild a RAID storage system and uh, for the re rebuild operation to happen, if we need to hold the data on the live file system temporarily onto a temporary storage, so we take some drives in, server chassis, storage server chassis in for as a temporary backup of the data while the rebuild is happening, we cannot get this pair out. This pair has to die within the fab. So the, the controls are so strong. Um, yeah, they, 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 they would not be looking at using cloud um, anytime. And yeah, I think everything is on premise. Um, within the fabs on the compute that needs to happen. The EDA will be slightly different. Yeah, I know that some EDA companies do have presence in the cloud and uh, all these questions about export control and IP protection has come into play, but fabs is a different story. I think it's also, there, there's, a, there's a bigger side of this as well, which is uh, there's a stigma associated with with running on other people's hardware and other people's resources that cloud providers have done a tremendous job in terms of managing compliance and um, and really doing a lot to validate that. But th there, there's there's an emotional side of this, which is may not be a technical piece, but where, where people don't necessarily want to put their most valuable data and algorithms and components of what they're working on up into resources that you know, other people may be actually sitting on as well. Um, and, you know, it, that that control of security is out of their is out of their control. Right. So um, th this, this is, I think, much bigger than EDA. But I think the cloud vendors have done a really good job in managing this. But it, it's still it's just going to take time for people to kind of get over the emotional concern that they're going to have about running in other people's on other people's resources. Thank you, Greg. Is there another question? There, there's one I see um, somebody asked about uh, FPGAs and the, the future of FPGA with you know, two of the main major players, Altera and Xilinx. You know, I think you being being acquired by Intel and AMD. Um, I, I, I think I don't think you're going to see support of, of that ecosystem start to dwindle, I think you may actually see it increase 
Uh, it's just taking time for that to happen. Um, but what I see is FPGAs are really well positioned and we'll, we'll stay there for uh, a lot of exploratory work that can be put into, into play very quickly. Uh, and I'd be a little careful again with, with what I could say, what I can't, but um, expect that FPGAs are going to be closer and closer to uh, CPUs and accelerators, right? And so they're going to become a more integral part. And you're going to see, I think, more people that can employ using FPGA elements to augment existing compute resources, as well as just prototype. Right? You see a lot of FPGA and prototype, but I think uh, you know, it still may take a, a couple of years for that to really start to get mainstream, but I'll see, I think you'll see more of it, not less. Thank you, Brock. Anybody have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think the, there's certainly a hope that the, the FPGA tools, like every EDA tool, has been the, the consternation of most people who try to use them. Um, and now that they've sort of gotten swallowed into these larger organizations, perhaps um, the, the, the tool the tools can just improve um as maybe as more people as more people become end users within the company they may start to demand the tools be better from the people who are developing them internally um that's one one way that they could potentially improve um but yeah i'm hopeful that uh that the fpga uh, ecosystem will continue and improve and, and certainly yeah there's the large prototyping systems from cadence that you utilize fpga there's um open source things like FireSim that run on um, AWS today. And there are so a number of large uh, efforts to start to use FireSim in a kind of a, a broader sense in some upcoming um, IARPA programs. Certainly, they're going to be using uh, FireSim rather heavily, uh, or that's the plan. <laughs> uh, so it'd be interesting to see if some of those solutions, uh, the scalability that you can combine the scalability of FPGAs in the clouds with some of the advanced hardware generation and kind of um, higher abstraction level um, ways to test out new architectures and new designs. Um, yeah, there's the interesting, interesting things happening there. Very interesting. Thank you, David. Fernando, I think you had something you wanted to add. About tools. Yeah, on the tools front, I mean, I just heard now that after seven years since Intel bought Altera, they're rolling some tools, or at least they're making one API um, part of, uh, you know, the FPGAs is part of what you use um, to, well, one API is part of what you use to program the GPUs, FPGAs. And I, you know, I just don't see the tools really kind of being prioritized for this. And it's also a much smaller market, right? So I think NVIDIA is something like 10 billion in revenue and um, Xilinx and Altera is something like 1.52, right? Their primary revenue source is not going to be, um, you know, deprioritized over for FPGAs. It still remains niche. It may be that they hire these or acquire these just for the talent because of chiplets, because they want to be able to have somebody that knows how to design things and knows, you know, the, this kind of circuit work, or maybe they can create the simulators, right? Um, it may be that they got them because they know the complexity of their chips are going to go up and not necessarily because they want to create newer, better FPGAs. Yeah, certainly FPGAs are niche, and then the use of it. FPGAs are niche, EDA is niche, and the use of FPGAs in EDA is another even smaller <laughs> thing. Um, because, yeah, most of the revenue is the signal processing, the cell towers, the you know the other types of uses that the way we want to use them for pre-silicon validation, architecture exploration is not... <laughs> not really on their roadmap and and that shows up in the the tool flow right like if you want to if you want to make one design and push it out if it takes a couple of days to synthesize and doesn't really matter but if you're trying to iterate your design um then those long synthesis times become a real pain right and they're to i guess now amd's credit when they used to be xilinx um there were some open source flows that were produced by Xilinx to kind of address some of those pain points, like the rapid write uh, flow that they that they developed, which is quite helpful. Um, so, but yeah, there, I agree that the movement on the tools is 
it's always too slow. It's always too slow. Thank you, David. So we are actually up on time. I, that I went that went very quick. I feel like we just started scratching the surface. <laughs> and we're already out of time here. So I will do what I usually do. I'll go around and give everybody one last one last comment, and I'm going to start with Fernanda. Uh, uh, no, not me first. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't have any comments. I think I'll I've go said to Glenn then. I'll come back to you at the end. Maybe you, maybe somebody will have said something that you want to. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> Pass all the way around. All right, Sorry, Greg. I'm sorry, President. It's my fault. I feel bad. <laughs> Greg won't pass. Would you say Greg won't or Greg, Greg won't pass? No, Greg won't pass. <laughs> um, I'd love to see more uh, movement of EDA tools to be easier to deal with. And I think this is probably, I'm stealing Christian's punchline here, but um, I'd love to see them being easier to deal with. Um, I'd love to see them being a little bit more modern. We have, uh, I mean, it, it, it's gotten so much, and again, this is kind of what I've heard from friends of friends, um, but it's gotten so bad in some cases, it's like one part of your workflow needs to run on SUSE. Another part of your workflow needs to run on RHEL, not just RHEL, but RHEL 6.7. Oh. And, um, and, and then you have to pull all these together. If you're not using containers, it's actually a very difficult thing to do. Um, and if you are using containers, you still have to come up with a way of how are you gonna pipeline these things together in a, in a cohesive way? If only there was a cloud native computing platform to do that. Um, but, but that's kind of where I think we need to be thinking about. And it's not just for EDA, it's across the entire industry. But uh, I would definitely like to see the barrier still coming lower and lower in terms of people being able to make effective use of these tools and these these applications. And in EDA, I think we're all being kind of held um, by the vendors um, for good reason, but at the same token, I'd love to see these vendors take a more active approach to this. That's great. Thank you, Greg. Krista? I think I pulled everything that I know about EDA already out of my mm -hmm. head. <laughs> this is the max I ever spoke about in EDA. Great discussion, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. David. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, say that I think I'm excited to watch the open source EDA community start to grow up, um, not only for accessibility, but I mean, there's a whole Slack channel with, you know, hundreds of maybe even over a thousand people that are all using the flow and we can ask questions. Um, and there's that's a just that alone is an amazing step forward. You don't have to dance around like, would you have this version from cadence and can I talk to you because we don't have NDAs. Um, so I think there's a that's that's in a very exciting development is all this open source hardware and open source uh, EDA flow. It's very cool. Thank you, David. Mr. Godlove. <laughs> I don't think that I've uh you know commented at all. I've I've been really happy to to kind of sit in on this conversation and to, <laughs> to just be a fly on the wall and, and listen in on this. Um, and, you know, I'm really interested, especially by obviously by the talk that I've heard about containers and, um, you know, containers within EDA and their applications. You know, I think we talked a little bit about containers in the um, in the uh, in the context of moving uh, these workflows out to the cloud. But I think that it's also it, it might be useful to think about how awesome it is that you can you can take the compute through containers and move it to wherever you know, you need to move it, like if, you, if you're running these workflows internally, and that can also help a great deal. And I'm sure it is helping a great deal with an EDA. I've been waiting for an opportunity to, um, you know, make a uh, comment about the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Douglas Adams <laughs> and talk about uh, EDA in the context of the world being designed by deep thought to answer the, to, to ask the question whose answer is 42, but I haven't had that opportunity to drag the conversation down to my level. So I'll just go ahead and pass at this point. Thank you, Dave. Brock? Well, EDA says thanks for all the fish, Dave. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll just say you know, to your question earlier about uh, how is EDA HPC, um, I think a, a great indicator is to look at you know, ANSYS that I think is more traditionally coming from the manufacturing side and applications. They have, they have applications that do EDA in uh, Cadence over the past couple of years, they have branched out, they have acquired companies for CFD. So you see the the crossovers where again, these massive conglomerates of, of ISVs 
are all accumulating apps across all of the HPC domains. And I think you see more of that cross effort. So it just, it just says EDA is HPC and HPC uh, relies on EDA. That's great. Thank you. Well, thank you to our panel for joining. Thank you for the audience for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Joshua. It's good to see you. So we will see you guys next week. Go ahead and like and subscribe, and we appreciate you joining. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks much. Thanks, David.